Okay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, welcome to our lecture today with artist Rachel Mayer, whose work we are currently hosting in a virtual exhibition entitled Familial Bodies. Um, I'll post a link in the chat following the presentation in case you haven't had a chance to check that out. Um, and as a, um, just as a request, please, after this, please turn our all cameras off and mute your mics um, to reduce distractions until the question and answer session following the presentation. And Rachel Mayer holds a Master of Fine Art from Idaho State University and a Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology and Ethnic Studies from Willamette University. She currently teaches at the College of Idaho. Her work has appeared in publications and exhibitions across the United States. She interned at the Aramont School of Arts and Crafts and was recently awarded a grant to purchase a floor, floor loom for weaving. She will be the upcoming winter resident artist at the Searles Place Residency in Garden City, Idaho. Thank you for being here with us, Rachel, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much for having me, Rebecca. <clears throat> um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all this afternoon, so thank you all for, um, for hanging out with me. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen for my presentation. Awesome. So um, as Rebecca said, my name is Rachel Mayer um, and I'm based out of Boise, Idaho. And I, I studied anthropology and, and ethnic studies in undergraduate. So I didn't really start out um, in with a fine arts background. And you know, while I was at Willamette, um, I, my main points of study were kind of this combination um, between anthropology, I took some sociology classes, um, gender um, and sexuality studies, as well as um, ethnic studies, so studying race and racism and really looking at hierarchies of power and how we form connections, how we are socialized, um, kind of these social constructions that we abide by, and you know, really asking these questions on how do we form community, and is community good, is it bad? And of course, right, that answer is not uh, a black and white answer, um, but you know, kind of our labels helpful on how we define ourselves, um, and how does that play into kind of um, community itself. And one of the, the quotes that has kind of always really stuck with me um, through um, kind of regardless of what I've, what I've done um, is this quote by uh, Keith Basso. Um, and it's from Wisdom Sits in Places, Landscape and Language Among the Western Apache. And he said, knowledge of places is closely linked to knowledge of the self, to grasping one's position in the larger scheme of things, including one's own community and just securing a confident sense of who one is as a person. And I really like this quote um, by Basso because I like to think about the memory of place and how storytelling um, is really situated in place um, without us even really thinking about it. But when we tell a story or we try to convey our experiences, place is always a very inherent part of that process. And storytelling informs community and kind of how we think um, about community. And so for me, community and thinking about community um, are very much kind of, um, kind of part of that. Oh, sorry about that. Um, and so whenever I think about kind of my own, um, my own personal community, um, it's really my family. And that's <clears throat> very much based on um, the fact that whenever I, when I was a kid and I, you know, was growing up and then also kind of into young adulthood, I moved um, 14 times. And I did that because my dad was um, in the military. But, um, you know, when my parents would tell us we were getting ready to move to a new place, they uh, would frame it kind of like as this, like, oh, we're going on vacation, um, kind of like a trick um, almost. And they would tell us about all the national parks we would be visiting and all the places we would see. And so they really, they framed it as kind of that vacation. And, and I really, I think, you know, situate community within environments um, and kind of frame socialization within landscape because my, my closest community, my family, kind of my constant community was always really being dictated by place. So we were being very much molded and shaped um, and constrained and then also liberated by place. 
And I'm very much a fiber artist um, due to um, my family's influence. And it was really passed down to me matrilineally. Um, this work is actually by my, uh, my dad's grandmother, um, Jewel Hale Mayer. And she created these quilts because she loved her family and she wanted to keep them warm. And this quilt in particular is a tied knot quilt. And a quilt, for those of you who don't know, is just, it's really kind of like a fabric sandwich. So you have your top layer of fabric. In this case, it's pieced fabric in this triangular pattern. And um, you've got your insulation or your batting um, and then your bottom layer of fabric. And then those are sewn together. And she didn't hand sew it together, but rather tied knots um, to make sure that her sandwich um, would stick. And she did this for a really clear purpose of warmth, um, right? Uh, same with the crocheted blanket on the right that she made. And then this work by my, uh, is by my mom's grandmother, um, Everin Wilcox Lemon. And she was a very prolific crocheter. We have more crocheted blankets from Everin than we could ever use. Um, they make great blankets or like blanket forts. Um, growing up, we use them a lot. Um, and, you know, she also made these blankets because she loved her family and wanted to keep them warm and wanted this comfort. And, you know, when I think about kind of like the ultimate gift you can give someone, it's really time, right? You can never get time back. It can be repaid, but it's never repaid in exactly the same way. And so that gift of time of labor, of making something um, that takes a long time because you care about someone else um, is something that I very deeply associate with fiber work. Um, and then these are the quilts of my, my mother um, has made. She's a prolific quilter, um, quilts every winter. And, you know, she really taught me how to sew, how to quilt, um, how to, you know, like fix things in like a, a kind of a fiber associated way, right? Or like these flexible elements that, that come together and are tied or looped um, or knotted. Um, and, Whenever I, you know, I learned, she taught me how to embroider when I was very young and I didn't really appreciate it then. I think like every young kid um, thinking that maybe it wasn't um, as important or it was boring in some way. And when I, you know, kind of fast forwarding to when I was living in Portland after graduating from Willamette, it's kind of like in this um, dark place, right? Um, of feeling like I'm sure we've all felt, um, you know, pretty lost and was thinking like, okay, I need a hobby. I need to kind of go back to art in some way. And I'd always really been interested in photography. And I, um, I really love photography because I was essentially like um, capturing this landscape through a lens and, and thinking about all these memories I associated with that place. And it was kind of like this physical reminder of that memory. And I, I love photography, but never really considered myself a photographer. And actually, you know, whenever I, my favorite part about photography is when I would, I would order photos and they would come in the mail and I would get to hold them. And so the materiality really mattered to me. Not so much like kind of the digital aspect of that work. Like it almost didn't become real until I could hold it. Um, and, and so when I was thinking about the photography I had done and all these photos that I had while I was, you know, sitting in a dark room in Portland, um, I also was like, okay, well, what other skill sets do I have? And kind of went back to kind of that first kind of elevated art form that I learned, which was embroidery from my mother stitching. And I've been drawn to landscape I've also really been kind of interested in like, okay, well, I have these memories of this lake or of this mountain, but what would it look like um, if a lake had a memory or like if a mountain could remember something and, and kind of those human um, ideas that kind of superimposed upon landscape. And this piece um, is an embroidered photograph of Quake Lake um, in Southwestern Montana. And I took this photo um, on my way to visit my brother for his graduation um, at Montana State University. And Quake Lake is a super interesting place 
it does hold a lot of memory because in August 17th of 1959, um, there was a huge earthquake that caused a landslide um, and blocked the Madison River and formed this lake. And 28 people died. Um, their homes um, and their bodies were never recovered. And um, or most of them were, most of it was never, um, like, seen again, um, and thinking very much about, like, this place has human memory, right, but also kind of, like, well, if I'm thinking about mountains and landscapes and kind of, like, the connection, right, because, of course, we are, we are connected to the landscape around us, like, what might that look like, and so I'm kind of wanting to kind of um, embroider on top of the space with purpose. And so kind of doing these undulating lines, thinking about movement um, within place. Um, and I also um, started to um, embroider um, like memories on top of memories in, in an interesting way. So this picture, this picture is of Dunedin Beach in New Zealand and it was while I was studying abroad and was feeling homesick. And so I embroidered some of my mother's quilt box on top of this photo. Um, kind of like you would hang quilts um, on a wall, kind of thinking about how you would hang them um, on this old pier. And so really kind of combining these memories I have and these associations I have um, with landscape in my life. And whenever I got into, you know, I got into graduate school um, without really having an art background, it's kind of a, you know, a DIY, like, um, our background in it in a few ways um, was thinking kind of like, okay, the, I'm really interested in these ideas of like, of what type of memories landscape might hold. And this piece guard is comprised of these hundreds of tubes of handmade um, bamboo paper. And so I made all this paper, rolled it, and um, then placed it on top of these canvases. And this is about nine feet wide. So pretty large. When you stand next to it or you walk up to it, like you are very much um, kind of like consumed by it in a way. And so um, thinking about like how I might show what has happened on landscape or give this hint of topography in some way, um, but also the sense of damage. Um, and I didn't really, I really didn't consider myself like making work. I wasn't um, an environmental artist necessarily, but I would just happen to be making um, work about the environment. And this really continued, um, wasn't really thinking very much about community at all at this point in my process. It was very much just um, thinking about landscape and place. And this piece aquifer um, is, was created by taking all this plastic and this these polyester fabrics and dip dyeing them. Accidentally actually dyed the floor <laughs> while I was dyeing this piece. So it's like my legacy at Idaho State University uh, fiber room. It's like a gray blue floor. And you know I, I dyed it using this dye that, that takes to synthetic materials, but I also made an effort to go and um, to take water from the Pocatello River, um, which is part of the aquifer system, and um, use that water specifically to dye um, this with. And so started to think a little bit more about my materials and how my materials could also communicate the ideas that I was trying to convey. And this became really apparent to me whenever I um, created this piece gravesite and I, um, layered a bunch of like potting soil in at the bottom of this piece, like in this kind of, um, you know, like uh, casket form, uh, or excuse me, coffin form. And every morning I'd go down into the gallery and I would spray it with water so that when you walked into the gallery, you smelled the dirt when you, um, when you walked up next to this piece. And so thinking about like, okay, the materials and how I could, could incorporate materials that um, maybe weren't um, like always part of fiber work, right? Um, in interesting and interesting and, you know, kind of like different ways. And also kind of thinking about like, okay, like I, I learned all these really traditional fiber techniques and how can I make them my own or how can I make them fit with me in a contemporary world? And um, this is a, a tapestry piece um, called Shroud. 
And as I was weaving it, I wasn't intending for it to necessarily um, look like the land, like a landscape, but it very, it very much like as I went on, like kind of thinking about these hills and these dips and these valleys and this negative space um, kind of lent itself to landscape for me. Um, and this actually, this piece is, um, I created kind of as like part of the healing process and then also in um, memory of a student of mine who died by suicide. Um, and she um, was like a big part of my life. Um, and, you know, thinking about like how we um, experience grief and how um, we form communities around grief. This is like kind of when I'm, I'm thinking a little bit more about like how community might play into my work um, and how also like how the body interacts with art in a gallery space. So I, whenever I wove this, I didn't intend for it to have this curve to it. Um, but then whenever I was finished with it, I was very much thinking about how we, you know, wear grief almost um, kind of around our shoulders, right? So this piece, and we can also be kind of like consumed by it as well. So this piece is meant for you to be able to walk into it, kind of like it's embracing you. And then also for you to turn around and kind of wear it on your back, almost like you're carrying it with you. And so this, this started to get me really interested in kind of like, okay, how do we, how do we interact with work in a gallery space? And how can we kind of break that down a little bit? Because, because fiber work was not necessarily ever intended to, um, to like go on a wall um, per se, or um, to be pokey or um, to be worn in this particular way, right? Like um, you think about like, tapestries like warming spaces um or blankets like warming people right um it's like a very a very different um kind of intention of craft work and so I was thinking about like how I could connect that and like the sense of body um but also create work that I felt really resonated with me personally and so this piece um extend I I created in this hallway in the hallway of the art department at Idaho State on the second floor and people had to um duck um and they had to move around this um this fiber um lots of people were clotheslines a lot of people really hated it um some a few people loved it but maybe not as many as um as hated it we shared the building with the music department and i just don't think that they were super um they just didn't really get it which was totally fine um and i i thought that was so interesting that that um art could have right this reaction beyond whether or not someone thought it was aesthetically pleasing but like if it was inconvenient to them as well and how people move around spaces and work and how I might kind of like incorporate that more into what I do um, and, um, and like how that experience might be kind of changed or perhaps like um, even elevated um, to, to think about like that tactility of it. So I started to, um, to think about like, okay, well, if I am making work on the wall, like how can I curve it and how can I um, make it um, so that whenever you stand in different positions, you're seeing kind of a different perspective um, of the work itself. And maybe I hang something really high or really low and, ha and how does that change that gallery space as well? And this is when I started also thinking about multiples. It you know, it turns out I've always been making multiples in my work, but um, like sometimes those really obvious things um, aren't so obvious to you in that moment. So. I started equating kind of these multiples with community and thinking about community structures and really incorporating that into what I had already been doing kind of with landscape and place within my work. And I'm also like at this point really thinking about form, right? And I still continue to think about form and kind of what um, shapes, um, or like the volume that I take up and how, how that might also kind of be part of the experience of the work. And this piece was uh, the first time I had really used um, like paper that I bought at a store in, a, in an art project of mine. Like I typically would make my own paper, um, but I really needed something that was like heavy duty. Um, also just making your own paper takes a lot of time which means you don't always have the time. Um, and so I use this cardstock in this piece and I chose this form, the tetrahedron. 
um, which has four sides, um, because it really conveniently um, like fits together in an interesting way. It's kind of pokey. Um, and I've always really been drawn to kind of triangular shapes as has, if you remember, kind of back to my mom's quilts, like I grew up with a lot of triangles because she's also, it turns out, really into triangles and points. Um, and so she chose this form because I really enjoyed the shape, but also found it intriguing that, you know, like it is the um, simplest kind of platonic solid while also being like really structurally sound and super strong. And like knowing that I'm not always gentle with my work, which is also perhaps why I'm a fiber artist because it like is its own cushioning, right? Like wanting to make sure that I make something strong um, that can kind of hold up um, to whatever is kind of thrown at it. And so I created this piece that was hanging from, this piece hangs from the ceiling. And um, because again, thinking about place and not just placing something on a wall. And I kind of like, I gave myself this challenge of making things that didn't go on walls or went on walls in, in kind of weird and different ways. And I really enjoyed the tension of this piece. That like when you, turns out when you walk underneath something that shouldn't be there, there's like almost this, um, like that primal part of your brain that's a little bit afraid that something's going to fall on you. So it creates this interesting tension as well. And as I was kind of thinking more about shape and form, I was doing more research on tetrahedron and um, found out this super cool fact that just conveniently fit in kind of with what I was, what I was making. Um, and that is that, you know, tetrahedron are really great at measuring hard to measure spaces. So whenever like geologists um, or scientists will go into kind of like a cavernous space and they're wanting to measure the volume of that space, um, but it's like really inconvenient to do so. Um, they will take measurements and take scans and then the algorithm that they use essentially places a bunch of these differently sized tetrahedron into the space in order to measure the volume of it because tetrahedron you can get to be as small as you need to um, and connect together and like fill up really hard to measure volumes. And I found that really interesting because also like community is super hard to measure. I mean, it's like social scientists have been trying to do it for a very long time. And so really kind of was thinking about like, okay, how can I incorporate tetrahedron and then um, kind of like the simplified version of, um, of like triangles in general into my work? Because trying to think right of like this cohesion and, and how to create like a body of work that really worked together. And excuse me, also really pulling kind of on my craft background, um, which was really important to me. And, um, you know, this piece is kind of like this combination of, of craft and art and functionality and, and not being functional at all. And it's actually comprised of five um, quilts that I made. And then I um, sewed all of these triangle, triangular forms on top of it. And, um, you know, I also um, had a lot of help in creating this piece just because there were hundreds of these little triangles and needed to be stuffed and sewn. And so, you know, I pulled in my community and asked them to help me in kind of like a sewing circle sort of way. And for those of you who don't know um, or who aren't nerds about sewing circles, um, they're they're really cool. They've got an old history of gathering and speaking and like forming and community um, and sharing stories, right, that, that go back hundreds and hundreds of years. And I, you know, fed people and asked them to stuff triangles with me for an afternoon and we sewed them together and, and knocked it out. And so um, also kind of thinking, you know, like, okay, I'm making work about community. And I also like need community to help me. Um, and I often need community to help me hang things, right? Because my work at this point was getting, was getting kind of large. Um, go back. So this is actually 11 feet across. Um, and like, there's no way to install it just as a single person. So kind of thinking about the multiple layers of work um, and how that could, um, could like contribute to that conversation. And I, you know, also um, was kind of thinking about these traditional techniques and how they might be viewed by um, craftspeople. So like I, you know, my, my mom's quilting friends were like, how, how dare she cut apart a quilt? Um, but this is exactly what I did um, for this piece here. Um, 
So um, this piece, um, I quilted as a whole cloth and I went over it multiple times um, with my sewing machine, partially because I'm actually kind of bad at quilting um, because my stitch tension is just like never really that great. But it turns out if you go over it multiple times, no one can tell that your, your stitch tension um, or your stitch length um, isn't ideal. So I created this cloth, cut it apart and was starting to use these forms. So taking a functional item like a quilt and then making it very non-functional within my work. And, you know, at this time, I'm also kind of still thinking about like, okay, how do bodies interact with work and how do they move around space? And wanting to create installations to like have people walk into spaces and kind of experience that. And that's hard, that's hard to do to create installations because you do, you do have to have like a space dedicated to that that someone will let you have, right? Also, you don't like, as far as like selling work, it's hard to sell someone like, you know, a pile of paper <laughs> folded into forms that needs to be installed in their space. So it's, it's kind of a gift of school to be able to do something like installation and actually the residency that I have coming up, I'll be doing an installation for. So I really wanted to take advantage of graduate school while I had it. And this is an installation in um, Missoula, Montana um, at a small gallery there. And um, this is comprised of like 8,000 um, of these tetrahedron forms. So still kind of pulling on that, those, that, well, those multiple meanings of, of tetrahedra um, within my work. And some of them are letter press printed, which was kind of one of these new schools, uh, these new skills I was developing. And um, was also kind of like, you know, I use like a lot of different colors in my work. Like, what is it like if I, if I don't really use, use color? Um, and with, you know, I'm still like experimenting. So I think like one thing I really want to convey within this um, is that like, you should always still be experimenting in your work and like, and you can introduce new ideas and new thoughts and new forms um, because like you're responding to the world as an artist. And, you know, whenever people were, were walking into this space, they had to make sure that they weren't stepping on these tetrahedra, like a, the few like tetrahedra last, um, lost their lives this night, but, um, but walking into it and walking up to it and kind of how that like invites people to experience it differently. And actually what I found when I was in Missoula is that a lot of people were not wanting to like walk up to the, the, the bulk of the form. They would kind of stop um, at this like barrier, like this invisible barrier right here um, and wouldn't get any further. And that kind of actually like, I was like, oh, like maybe this piece kind of failed a little bit because people aren't interacting with it in the way that I want them to. So for my thesis, I like forced people <laughs> to walk on things. Um, so this is my thesis project. Um, and um, in order to get into the gallery, you have to walk on top of the art. And these are, these stuffed um, felt tetrahedra, um, again, um, pieces that essentially like function as like um, a stuffed animal kind of carpet almost um, in a way. And, um, and like encourage you to like lay down in them and to sit in them and to gather and, um, and to have conversations with people who are across from you and um, kind of tied it all together by using like a lot of string um, to really like control how people interacted with the piece if they couldn't go outside of it and view it from the outside and they had to physically be in it and they had to, they had to interact with it. Um, and then also like thinking about like, okay, multiples representing community and like multiple people within a whole. Um, also like you're gathering as a community within this space. Um, and then like thinking about place still as well. So kind of envisioning this almost as like this topographical landscape again. Um, and this is when I really started to pull color into, into the work that I do and really using um, these photographs that I've taken of landscape um, to inform like how I use color. So this is of the Sawtooth Mountains um, here in Western Idaho, Craters of the Moon National Monument, uh, closer to like Cocotello area, Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming. 
Yellowstone National Park, Glacier National Park. While I owe my allegiance to the Tetons, might be my favorite place in the whole world um, here in Glacier, just like absolutely breathtaking. Um, and so thinking kind of about landscape and photography um, and like, and having all these images essentially and not knowing what to do with them. Because at this point, I'm not really embroidering photographs any longer, but like wondering how I can incorporate them into my work. And so starting to very specifically take like the knowledge I knew about dyeing and fabric manipulation um, and pulling in um, like those dye references from those photographs themselves. Um, so this is a quilt titled Yellowstone based off of images I took at Yellowstone. Um, and it's also one of my mom's quilt blocks. So whenever I'm like feeling uninspired, I basically just steal from my mom. Like what quilt is she working on? Um, at any point in time, I take that quilt block and kind of like almost, right, like cut it and then like blew it outwards to create this, this piece. And um, this is like, um, dyed, it has fabric paint on top of it, um, lots and lots of stitching, like really heavy stitching, right? Um, and which started because I'm a terrible quilter, um, but like very much like has become kind of one of my signatures because I just so enjoy, it's almost like this a drawing aspect of drawing on top of fabric. Um, it creates these really great, really great textures. Um, and then I also, this was my last semester of grad school. I'd already done my thesis. I was like, I might as well like play around with some ceramic which I really have not hadn't done since um, elementary school. So um, utilizing these ceramic forms and attaching them on top. So um, the fabric is not like the three-dimensional piece, but I'm rather adding an element on top of it, um, which is something that I still continue to do um, and kind of like gives me that need for sculpture while also like creating practical pieces that hang on walls um, for gallery spaces. And kind of like in this kind of like semester of play, um, if you will, um, also thinking a lot about the materials I have that I can utilize. So I had all this paper from printmaking, um, I had a bunch of tracing paper and newsprint, and um, I created this book form out of it that was inspired by the winter landscape of Pocatello, um, where I went to graduate school. And, you know, if you make um, work that's influenced by like the West, um, in the landscape of the West, like you start to notice a lot of blues and purples just they continue to pop up in your work, which is what I was noticing. Um, and so I took this paper and I dip dyed it into indigo um, and then created kind of this mountain sort of book. Um, I bound it um, with um, silk yarn that was also dyed in the same indigo vat and was really interested in kind of like what type of form it would take and how little control I had over that form because this binding was super floppy. Um, and kind of thinking about all of the skills that, that I've been learning, right? And, um, and I know how to bind a book in a journal, but like, what if I make that so much larger and then like have it kind of undulate? Um, and it's, it's kind of an installation in itself, right? But it's a much more practical size form, right? It's like only three and a half feet wide instead of, um, you know, being 14 feet wide, like my thesis was. And kind of thinking like practically, like when I don't have as much space, how am I gonna utilize the, the work that I make and the, the things that I wanna make kind of within my own art practice. Um, and this really um, also, you know, kind of brought me to, okay, well, thinking about these forms and these, these sculptures and these quilts and pieces that I've been making that are very much influenced by the landscape around me, um, you know, like, what if their natural habitat was that landscape they were inspired by? And then when they were put into the gallery, that that's like, kind of an out of their natural, their natural habitat in a way. And so um, I really started kind of incorporating more photography into my work as well and wanting to show the pieces themselves like next to the photographs that influence them um, or like even actually in fact photographing them within the place and having those photographs tell that story. Um, because when this, this piece is made out of power mesh and resin and 
power mesh is actually what they used to make spanks out of fun fact so it's super stretchy and like really tough um but like it looks completely different in a gallery setting than it does installed you know um military reserve here in boise like in the foothills um with all the sagebrush behind it and so um thinking a lot about like presentation of work um and understanding that i can't always install work in a landscape right so wanting to kind of have that flexibility and also thinking about okay like how um how your perspective can change and like what I, the thing I, I love about installation is essentially it feels like you're looking at like infinite number of pieces just depending on how you're situated within that space and how can i kind of recreate that um within these three-dimensional quilt forms that i was making so um, when you look at the straight on, you can see one of my mom's quilt blocks, again, stole from her, shamelessly. Um, but then when you look at kind of any version of the side or you move to the side at all or move within the space, um, like you can't, like it's not clear to you, right? So again, like really thinking about how people view the work itself. And, and kind of incorporating all of, all of these skills um, to continue to make to make work that like really speaks to my own experience. Um, so this is the Craters of the Moon National Monument. I'm using that again as dye inspiration. And then this quilt here um, is like a whole cloth quilt, meaning that it's just like a, um, a piece of fabric um, that doesn't have any seams to it or anything. And I'm just quilting over and over and cutting it apart and then reforming these shapes into these three dimensional shapes um, that are then like, cut into these quilt block pieces. So it's three dimensional, um, but when you look at it straight on, like perhaps that's not always super evident. Um, and so again, like playing with kind of that perception um, while also tying to landscape, tying to multiples and community and like really trying to make all of those things work together. Um, and I have been a weaver um, for a few years, for quite a few years now, but really kind of struggled and like, okay, how do I, how do I make that part of my work? Like, I think I kind of default sometimes to quilting because that's what, um, you know, my mom did and, and her grandmother and my dad's grandmother. And like, you go back far enough, like we're, we're probably all quilters, right? Within our family history and our family tree. Um, but weaving requires kind of like specialized equipment. It requires like a loom, right? Not just a sewing machine. So, wanting to think about how I could incorporate a fiber practice that really was not practiced by my family, but still kind of thinking about like, you know, thinking back to that quilt that my dad's grandma made, um, Jewel, she did that tied off quilt and like thinking back to kind of the basics of fiber and that like, it really is just loops and it's not um, and you know, you're, you're, um, wrapping things around other things. And so I really started, I kind of started to form these knots. Um, and it just so happens that it really, um, coincided, um, with the pandemic and, um, you know, kind of like isolation, um, thinking really about like a lot of terrible things happening in the world and like the inequality and um, like relearning lots of things over the last few months. And like how like it does, it does feel like you're kind of nodded out that there's this tension, right? Um, but also you are like one within like a community um, of like multiples. And so wanting to convey that while also really very much like also conveying like how I've been feeling and like and using these simple forms was kind of one of those ways to do it and still still very much influenced by landscape and, and photography um and like how how that really ties into it um but I think I've always been a really technical dyer wanting to have really concrete reasons why I dye a certain color and, and I was kind of like fulfilling that by taking these photographs and sampling colors from them. But then like, um, and like, and continuing to do that with quilting as well um, within my work um, and like the, the different colors and the different techniques. But at, at some point in time, um, just like feeling like almost kind of confined um, by all of like this really strict kind of color work. Um, and, 
you know, as the pandemic is, is kind of like raging, like I just was like, you know what, I'm just not, I'm not going to care about color anymore. I'm just going to use what I have. And so that really pulled me into to making these mats specifically that have kind of like no color inspiration other than I liked the colors together. And, um, you know, using these, these, um, these, weaving patterns that I, I felt were interesting um, while I was just like alone in my house. And these colors like really spoke to me. Um, and it then inspired me to dye all of this yarn. Because I think, you know, sometimes whenever there's a lot of stressors in your life as an artist, you, you don't know what to do and you feel kind of like creatively stuck. And, but it's like really important that you keep making or you do something right and so for me I was like I'm just going to dye all this yarn and I have no idea what I'm going to use it for and um you know every night I just dye yarn in my bathtub and before I knew it I had 17,000 yards of yarn that I had dyed and I I don't have a purpose for it typically when I dye yarn I um I have a really specific goal in mind but for this I was just, I'm just going to make um and not be kind of stuck in that and so since then I've been incorporating um this yarn into my work um and like thinking about color in kind of these bright ways because as it turns out color makes me really happy and and so you know when everything else is kind of going to shit um like I might as well incorporate those those colors and those things that, that bring me joy and, and so I would encourage kind of like everyone, you know, like of really, really understanding that you are part of a world and you are going to change with that world as it's changing. And for me, I kind of, I feel like very much that um, my work has also, has also been changing, like as the world um, changes, which is absolutely okay. It's also okay not to make, to make things and have no idea what kind of purpose they have to them. So it's really important to kind of have those inspirations and that foundation, but um, also really cool to, to kind of go where, where things take you. And so that's kind of where I am right now in my art practice. I have this residency coming up in December where I have to figure out what I'm going to do with these 17,000 um, yards of yarn. And I'm really excited to kind of see, see what happens. Um, so that, that's all I have for you. And um, if you've got any questions, I, I would love to, to answer them.